All right. Well, hello, folks, and thanks for sticking around. I'm going to talk about some of some of the things I've been working on related to uh, basically trying to get rid of phantom traffic jams. Uh, I think it'll be obvious as we go through the talk that there's a ton of folks that are involved uh, that are trying to help us accomplish a goal. But I want to just dive right in and basically show you what is keeping me up at night. I think most folks have seen videos like this, right, where uh, you see some grouping of traffic. Uh, I don't know. There's a collection of cars here. They're stopping on the road for seemingly no apparent reason. And, you know, as we've kind of unpacked in several of the talks uh, here already, these, these types of issues are basically properties the way that humans drive. Uh, there's a, a condition that relates to the string stability of the drivers where more essentially what's happening is small perturbations in one driver are propagating to the driver behind. As they propagate to the driver behind, they amplify. The driver behind that amplifies it further, and seemingly out of nowhere, you have stop and go traffic. Okay, so what bothers me about this, besides the fact that it's really frustrating to be in one of these traffic jams as a driver, uh, it's obviously fuel inefficient. That's bad. It's probably not safe to have high variability of speeds on the roadway. Um, that's bad too. But there's other issues too, which is like, I, I can't answer basic questions. For when people ask me how common are phantom traffic jams, I actually don't know. Um, look at all the roadways that we've got instrumented. If anybody has a way to quantify what fraction of the traffic conditions end up in these stop and go driving behavior that you see in this roadway, uh, I'd love to hear some ideas on it. I know from the research community, we've spent a lot of time studying this stuff, right? We put uh, helicopters over freeways in the 70s to try to capture these features. We you know, have cars drive around in circular tracks and study their behavior. Uh, but to actually quantify their presence in the real world um, I think is an open question that we really should be thinking about. Um, we know anecdotally it, it occurs and we definitely want to be thinking about control technologies that we can start putting into individual vehicles to, to eliminate these causes. Mm -hmm. So at, at the core of what we're trying to do, uh, we built a consortium of, of partners in, uh, in a team called the Circles Coalition. And basically we're uh, trying to team up and bring in the right expertise to tackle this, this problem of what can you do to automated vehicle technologies deployed at a limited scale uh, on a subset of vehicles that can try to eliminate that phantom traffic jam? Uh, the team is led by Alex Vian at UC Berkeley, uh, and you see the folks that are involved here. We've got partners from Rutgers, Temple, Arizona, uh, and importantly, the Tennessee Department of Transportation for reasons that you'll see here shortly, as well as two vehicle manufacturers. And the work is funded in different parts by the US Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation, Basically, we're all trying to work together to figure out how to go from uh, you know, these phantom jams that, that we have evidence exists on the roadways to a scenario in which the types of cars that are being sold today and tomorrow can get rid of those jams. So at its core, kind of here's the roadmap for what we're trying to do on this, on this coalition. In 2016, we tested the basic concept, right? We put uh, cars on a circular track. One of the vehicles is automated. When it's initially under control for humans, uh, controlled by, by a human driver, you see these types of stop and go waves show up on the track. And once you activate the control uh, on that vehicle that's being traced by the red arrow right now, that vehicle is essentially acting as a traffic jam eating vehicle. It smooths out the rest of the flow, eats that jam, smooths the flow overall to the point where the fuel consumption is significantly reduced, not just by that vehicle, but all the other vehicles behind. Great one car, circular track, no lane changes. Uh, the core idea works, but every time we show this type of video, everyone complains about the fact that, hey, it's a circular track, it's not an open road. It doesn't have the complexities of the real world. And you know, folks are right. Uh, you know, This is a nice laboratory scale setup, but does not actually tackle the real challenges when you put on, on an open road. Um, you know, Like for example, miscellaneous lane changing. Okay, so to get to an open road, there's lots of challenges we have to solve, but one primary one is that it's not possible to just go to ask Jonathan Sprinkle, like we did here, to take his one several hundred thousand dollar automated vehicle and just build us a fleet of those so we can go out and test these concepts. That really pushed our team to start thinking about what can be done with the automated vehicles that are already on the roadway. These are the adaptive cruise control systems. So in 2018, uh, we teamed up again and got eight vehicles that all run adaptive cruise control technologies, turn on the stock ACC systems and have them line up in a, in a platoon of adaptive cr cruise control cars. Key piece here is either stock systems, there's no communication between the vehicles, they're all just running their uh, car following logic uh, that comes from the manufacturer. We cause the lead vehicle uh, that's kind of pacing that platoon to slow down 
And we watch as that slowdown propagates through the platoon. We see that characteristic behavior of a string instability where the car behind the lead vehicle slows down, the car behind it slows down more. And this continues to the point where the last car in the platoon, this white vehicle, actually gets below the minimum operating set point uh, of that stock ACC system and it disengages. And so we ask the driver to take over control and pull that vehicle to the side. So, you know, the, the piece that we're trying to exploit here is if these vehicles already have this type of technology on them, maybe we can use that technology to start doing flow smoothing at scale. And this test shows that we can't just rely on the stock ACC systems that are on the roadway because they are not string stable. So what are we trying to do now? We're trying to modify those stock ACC systems as minimally as possible um, and then get them deployed on an open roadway where we can instrument not just what those vehicles are doing, but what all the other vehicles on the roadway are doing as well. And we've ambitiously, ambitiously set a target to build a fleet of 100 of these types of vehicles and put them out in real traffic so we can test the effects of flow smoothing uh, at, at an open roadway with all the complexities that are not captured in a ring experiment. Okay, well, what makes this possible is the fact that cars today uh, have level one and level two autonomy systems already on them. So this is a picture of the lab vehicle we purchased at Vanderbilt here recently. It's a stock Toyota RAV4 from 2020. Um, and we can read directly off of the CAN bus information that's absolutely critical to characterize the driver behavior of individual drivers, as well as uh, the behavior of traffic in the neighborhood. So the dash cam video here is showing one of the experiments we did about a year ago where we're following uh, a lead vehicle, the red car in the bottom right here, and just plotting the radar data that is seen uh, from that stock radar unit. The key piece here is that in order to take advantage of this vehicle as a sensor, we only need to add data logging equipment. No additional aftermarket sensors were installed on this vehicle, other than the dash cam, obviously, to record the footage. Um, and so what we're really trying to do now is characterize all the data that can help inform the behavior of how these two cars drive, and then use that data ultimately to not only uh, measure what's happening, but ultimately control these vehicles using minimal, minimally invasive uh, controllers that are modifying those stock ACC systems. Okay, so on the vehicle side, a lot of work to, to, to still do there, uh, but that's a lot of the work that, uh, that we're happy to have folks like Jonathan Sprinkle that, that work on. Okay, well, there's another problem that we have, which is that if we're gonna deploy these cars on a real roadway, we need to figure out how those vehicles are going to interact with the rest of the cars so that we can actually anticipate the types of challenges we'll find on the open roadway. These types of videos are a dime a dozen. You find an autonomous vehicle that does one thing wrong and everybody you know, laughs at it. Here you can see a Waymo vehicle from I guess around 2018 that's trying to merge onto the freeway. And lo and behold, human drivers aren't as kind as uh, control algorithms for the vehicle might wish they are. And so no one lets that vehicle into the, into the freeway. Well, like that's the type of challenges that we need to be robust against. You design a control technology that works really well in your simulation. Your simulation has nice behavior of how human robots drive. Human robots, I mean kind of jointly that it is a human driver, but we roboticize them to the point where they no longer are a human driver and they behave kindly for your automated vehicle. Um, what we need to do is capture the real ways that real humans interact with real automated vehicles and sometimes counteract the benefits that we are trying to get those cars to achieve. I took a trip down memory lane and realized that a lot of the things that, uh, that we were talking about in the IPAM long program in 2015 are, are probably uh, even more relevant today than we thought they might be. So that we put together a white paper at the end of the long program that was really talking about the limits of the data that we have available right now in the traffic flow community. And this was prior to automated vehicles and this idea of mixed autonomy being so important, but we still recognize that we really have very limited ability to characterize how humans drive because we have so little high quality trajectory data. And so kind of building on that idea is something that has occupied my own research group here for the last couple of years at Vanderbilt. So the roadmap for to the remainder of our time today, I wanna to talk a little bit about trajectory data collection and the work that we've been doing and then pivot a little bit to some of the challenges with what can be done with data that really help inform the, the likelihood that we're gonna see phantom traffic jams on the roadway. I'll talk about what can be done today if you take roadside infrastructure like inductive loop detectors or radar units to try to inform or understand the behavior of the individual vehicles that are driving along the roadway. And then kind of look towards the future. If I give you a bunch of trajectory data, is that going to help us better characterize the parameters of how, how people drive? 
Okay, so let's talk about trajectory data collection. Um, the, the slide I've got here is a, is a summary of the NGSIM uh, data set that was collected by uh, the US Department of Transportation in around 2006. And basically uh, from a 30-story uh, building, uh, several uh, cameras were pointed down at Interstate 80 just in front of Berkeley to try to capture uh, the behavior of individual vehicles. Um, and the data that was collected there was ultimately helpful in informing about uh, three 15 minute long data sets on Interstate 80. There's a couple other uh, experiments done in LA and on some surface streets that gave the transportation research community trajectories of real drivers on real roadways to try to characterize their driving behavior. The data set is widely popular, but everyone has the same wish list. You know, we wish the data were longer, that maybe we had more than uh, these 15 minute snippets of, of data, three of them from the I-80 data set. And if it were longer, that'd be better too, right? Because there's some features that actually take some time to build. And if the data set is too short in length, you just can't see those things. So, you know, a lot of things that the NGSIM experiment did right, it was having the, you know, an amazing idea, but where it struggled was just the fact that computer vision algorithms in 2006 are nowhere to where they are today. So we've kind of been building on that idea and thinking about what it's going to take if we want to put a fleet of 100 vehicles on real freeways to measure what's happening with those vehicles with the rest of the traffic that happens every day. And so I'm showing you two videos here from Interstate uh, 24, just outside of Nashville, about uh, 10 miles from where I am sitting right now, that show kind of the chaos that happens on an evening commute. You have cars that speed up and slow down. Um, the picture at the bottom is from one of the existing uh, closed circuit TV systems that the Tennessee Department of Transportation has deployed on the freeway. And as this video plays, if you're careful with, with your eye and if the video is coming in a clean rate for you, you'll see there's a collection of cars that propagate much like that phantom jam I showed on that first video. They propagate back here, a big space opens up. So what we want to do is try to capture that, that data that is coming from about 150,000 vehicles a day that pass through this freeway and get it to the point where we can get trajectories for every single one of those cars. And the hope is that as we start thinking about controlling vehicles at, the, at individual scales to influence aggregate traffic phenomena like stop and go driving, uh, getting that trajectory data is going to be really important to help characterize those interactions. All, ultimately, we also think it's going to be helpful for a lot of additional studies that we might want to do, not just putting our own cars out there, but if you just want to help better understand safety, understanding the nuances of how people are driving individually, what kind of lane changing you see, you know, getting huge volumes of this trajectory data is certainly going to be helpful for unlocking better understanding of safety. Um, we're also thinking about if we put up this, this infrastructure, cameras on the roadway to produce trajectories, it's also gonna be useful for helping to understand a variety of other connected and automated vehicle technologies. But the core ideas here are that we're gonna take an open, open freeway that has real human drivers on it, instrument it basically to death with 4K resolution video cameras so that we minimize the, the possible amount of occlusion that you could see on the freeway to allow ourselves to get data on every single vehicle and how they interact with every other single vehicle via their trajectories. So high resolution video camera data, uh, cameras with the goal of producing trajectories. Okay, in 2019 in the summer, we basically started this endeavor to try to understand, you know, what the limits of, uh, of current sensing with uh, visual analytics uh, could be. Um, we know that we need to get these cameras as high up as we possibly can, because the higher up the cameras are, the less likely we're going to be occluded by a semi truck that blocks our field of view to a car behind. Uh, with uh, our, folk, our friends at the Tennessee Department of Transportation, we identified the largest uh, piece of infrastructure that the Tennessee DOT operates is a 110 foot tall steel pole. You're looking at real people right next to these poles. They are massive. And what we were able to do is pull down the existing uh, high definition uh, video camera that is used by humans inside a traffic management control center to see what's happening on the freeway. And instead install this mounting bracket that holds six 4K resolution cameras that can aim at different parts of the freeway. Uh, because this is a live piece of infrastructure that the TDOT uh, Tennessee Department of Transportation still uses in their traffic management center, we had the additional condition that we still had to be able to use their uh, camera and keep it operational while logging data from these, video, from these additional cameras. This was good because it showed the proof of concept. I mean, why do you need six cameras on, this, on, on these things in the first place? 
Well, it is to make sure that you never have uh, spots that are blind to your cameras. Um, and it was really helpful also in identifying how important the height of these cameras are. Uh, but of course, it's challenging because you know you can see that the way that we manufactured this uh, mounting bracket was not something that uh, is really designed up to hold up to the weather conditions that one would experience if you put these things out there for multiple years. So this past, I'd say, eight months, we've been on a on a very crazy rush with the Tennessee Department of Transportation and several contractors, including Stansel Electric, MG Squared, Surveillance One, and Gresham Smith, a local consultant that's helping us through the design process here, to go from one set of cameras on an existing piece of infrastructure to dedicated infrastructure on the side of the roadway that gets us the ability to start pulling these trajectories out. So you're seeing activities that we put in uh, the end of August 2020, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, a couple hours in the morning, we blocked a couple lanes of Interstate 24 just outside of Nashville. And this team of contractors uh, started putting up the 110 foot tall poles that make up this new instrument that's really helping us understand the behavior of human traffic. Okay, some just ideas of how complex this thing is. To pull this off in eight months, um, the lead time for the steel on these poles can take on the order of six months. We had to design the stiffness of the poles. We had to design the foundations for this stuff. Um, we had to go and figure out how to get uh, those cameras to push all that data down these poles so that we can record it um, on a dedicated fiber network. Um, and in terms of accomplishments, these contractors are putting these poles up in something on the order of like 14 minutes for the first pole, 11 minutes for the second pole, and under eight minutes for the third pole. So really impressive feat just on the physical construction aspects. Well, that's impressive. The part that interests me most is actual data that comes from this. So uh, after we constructed the poles in the last six weeks, we've been installing the cameras, pulling them up the poles, doing unit tests on all the cameras to make sure that they're pulling data at the right rates at the bottom of the camera, uh, at the bottom of the pole, and then piping all that data back to a dedicated server room where we can log continuously all of the camera data. And what you're seeing on the bottom here is a video that captures the 18 cameras worth of trajectory data, six cameras per pole, three, camera, uh, three poles total, 500 foot spacings on those poles, where we can do things like trace a semi truck from the top left video here into the next video frame, into these two video frames. As it goes out of the frame here, you'll see it catch on row two, and it goes across the second pole, only to be captured at the same time by pole three, and we can capture that truck as it passes through the network. So this is our validation system. It's basically validating the concept of placing multiple poles uh, and anchoring video cameras on those poles so that we get complete coverage of the, of the vehicles as they pass through. Right now, we're currently still running a set of, quote, burn-in tests where we confirm the performance of the system. The numbers I saw this morning is that we are currently capturing something like 99.95% of all of the frames that these cameras are transmitting, they end up back on our dedicated server. So we're capturing all of the frames of all of the cameras that are out there collecting this data. In terms of data volumes, just to give you a rough round number, this is all 4K resolution video data compressed at H.264. We're talking about 10 terabytes of data a day that we're currently recording. Of course, we don't really want that, uh, that video data. What we care about is the trajectories. And so we've been working uh, over the last year on trying to produce tracking algorithms that can operate on 4K video data and produce these trajectories in real time. And by real time, we need to be able to produce 30 frames a second on a GPU, because essentially we're gonna have to have at least one GPU per camera. Um, otherwise, we're gonna end up not being able to process all the data that comes in. So what we get to start with is, uh, is a frame, right? A frame from the video. And what we're trying to do first is actually detect the location of the vehicles that are in that frame. That's an object detection step. And there is a variety of different object detectors such as YOLO and ResNet and a few others that are really good at detecting objects in scenes. Um, once we have objects detected in scenes, what we wanna do is then look at how those objects in the scenes relate over time. So we can look at multiple frames of video data Given the location of the vehicle in the current frame, we basically run a Coleman filter in the background that tells us in camera coordinates, basically in, in terms of pixel motion, where the current vehicle is, how fast it's moving, and where we expect to see the vehicle again in the next time step. We can then localize the vehicle in the next time step and start producing these trajectories that, that identify the pathway of the vehicle in this, in this movie. Once we've got the 
pixel coordinates uh, of the movie and outlining the trajectories in the, in the film, what we then need to do is actually convert those from camera coordinates into real world coordinates so we actually can follow the tracks of the vehicles on the open roadway. Here's what this actually looks like. You can see in the main video here, the bounding boxes that are outlining that we've identified different vehicles and their types as they move along the roadway. This is a video shot from exactly one of the cameras that we put up on that pole. And then the top inset video here is showing you the little trace of the vehicle locations mapped back into the real world coordinates. So this is a static image from Google Maps. And you can see as these vehicles move through the scene, how they're located on the map coordinates, i.e. the trajectories that we actually care about are this information that's up here. Okay, so that's cool. And one of the things that we're pretty excited about is just the potential of this data, not just for understanding the behavior of individual drivers, but for the Tennessee DOT, it's also important to figure out how this can help them do better traffic management overall. It just happened that in the snippet of data we pulled from this burn-in test, uh, we found a vehicle that pulled off on the side of the roadway. And in camera, you know, in the, in the real coordinates of the camera, we can see this vehicle is being identified. When we map it into real world coordinates, we can actually identify how far off to the side of the roadway that vehicle is. So it starts to give the potential insights for how one might be able to take this, this type of data and not just use it for science, but also for practical applications that the DOT cares about today. So I, I wanted to try to figure out like uh, the right way to characterize the data that's coming off of the system. And the way that I've been thinking about it is in terms of the vehicle miles of trajectories that are collected from the data set. So using the NGSIM as kind of the baseline, um, in the 45 minutes of video data collected on the I-80 data set, there's about 1,800 vehicle miles of data in there. And as I hinted at earlier, that data has really become the backbone of the traffic simulation community. In 2018, there was a new data set that was produced via drone footage, where the drones were flown overhead to capture about a 400 meter section of freeway. And over the course of 24 hours, they collected on the order of 25,000 vehicle miles of data. So an order of magnitude larger than what's in NGSIM. Okay, the disclaimer of course, is these both data sets are real. You can go download them. Uh, what we're hoping to do with just that validation system in the next year, if we can produce trajectories from those cameras continuously, and that's what we're gonna start implementing as soon as this burn-in test finishes, in a year, because of the traffic volume on I-24, we'll be generating on the order of 16 million vehicle miles worth of data a year. So it uh, really shows the potential of the type of dedicated infrastructure that TDOT has allowed us to deploy on the roadway is really going to help unlock much, much, much better models of how humans drive that we can then ultimately use that data in simulations and other studies to really start to better design control algorithms that can manipulate the way that humans drive by only actuating a subset of vehicles in the flow. Okay, so that's it on the trajectory data side and what we're doing in terms of testbed development. I want to pivot now and talk about sort of the things that we're also working on, which is trying to build traffic simulation environments that as we're putting up the testbed infrastructure can give us a precursor so that we can develop good uh, control algorithms that test in simulation that will ultimately work well on, on the freeway. And then I'll maybe uh, take the remaining time that I have and give some hints about what the, some of the challenges remain, even if you give yourself trajectory data from cameras, some of the challenges are still identifying parameters of car following models. Let me start with just a, uh, an observation. This, this paper and quote, uh, I want to thank uh, my student George Gunter for finding. It, it's a great paper that basically summarizes the uh, PEMS inductive loop detector system in California. And it has a quote, again, check the year, this was in 2007, that microscopic models, the models of individual human driving behavior, have scores of parameters but are calibrated using aggregate point detector data like inductive loops. And as a result, most parameters are simply set to default values and no attempt is made to estimate them. That quote is a very strong opinion, um, but it has at least some directionality that, that is, is, I think, worth kind of capturing. One, the type of inductive loop detector data that is coming from many of the sensor systems around the country is aggregate data. The data can be aggregated on five minute intervals. And when the data becomes too aggregated, it becomes very difficult to reason about the behavior of individual vehicles. One of the reasons it is aggregated is because a lot of that sensing infrastructure was deployed a long time ago where data rates uh, were very limited. It was actually hard to get data off of those systems back to a place where you could record it. Um, 
And at the same time, I think it's un, unfair to say that the research community hasn't been interested in, in calibrating microscopic models. And in fact, they have. But from a practitioner point of view, it's actually a non-trivial feat to take inductive loop detector data or other aggregate information and try to determine what the parameters of these complex microsimulation software systems should be. So we've been recently with uh, Benny Seibold and his team at Temple thinking about some of these issues with, you know, if, if TDOT gives us some radar data from I-24, is there any way that we can characterize the, the phantom traffic jams that are on that roadway? The idea being that, okay, cars are passing under the sensor. From the sensor, I get aggregate information. I get, for example, 30-second count data, which is a proxy for flow, and I get the 30-second average speed. All the, all the vehicles that pass through, I get their time average speed as they pass under that sensor. Okay, and what we wanna know is basically, can you take this type of aggregate data and determine the parameters of the dynamics of individual vehicles so that you can identify the, the nature of the phenomena on the roadway, such as these phantom traffic jams that might be occurring as they pass through this sensor. So to kind of set up the problem, I'll just kind of quickly go through this because I think uh, Keitan had very similar ideas in, in his talk from earlier today. But basically you've got a following vehicle, we're gonna describe its dynamics. It depends on its speed and the space gap, basically the distance from the front bumper to the rear bumper uh, of the vehicle ahead. And the lead vehicle velocity we'll, we'll treat as some input, okay, that is known to us. And so the space gap dynamics is basically just the rate of change of these, uh, of these uh, sorry, the difference of the, rel uh, the velocities of the two vehicles, uh, denoted here delta V, and the acceleration of this following vehicle will be some mathematical model that has some parameters in it, theta, that is a function of possibly the space gap, uh, the velocity, and the relative velocity to the vehicle ahead. And there are quite a few models in this form. If we analyze that uh, car following model and we consider its equilibrium dynamics, um, the equilibrium space gap we can compute, it will be some function of the speed and it will be some function of the parameters theta. And given that equilibrium speed, we can directly compute the traffic density if we know the average length of the cars on the roadway L. Once we know the density, it's a simple matter to compute the flow as a function of the density. So these parameters that are in the car following model uh, characterize the equilibrium driving, the equilibrium driving gives us a proxy for the, for the density or a way to compute the density from which we can compute the flow. And the fundamental diagram or this flow density relationship, that's the type of data that we'll get from those sensors. So here's an example with the intelligent driver model. Basically what I'm gonna do is replace the acceleration dynamic, not with some arbitrary function of speed, spacing and relative speed, but a specific function, which comes from uh, a well-known model that's widely used to characterize human driving behavior. The form is not critical, but what is important here is that there are six parameters of this model, which I've highlighted in blue. And so what we wanna do first is to check which of these parameters influence which aspects of the aggregate traffic dynamics. So the way that we do that is we compute the equilibrium space gap uh, for that model. And we can see right away that if we compute the equilibrium space gap, only four of the six parameters show up here. That means that only four of the six parameters will play a role in determining the shape of the fundamental diagram. Two of the parameters don't show up in the equilibrium analysis and therefore won't influence the shape of the fundamental diagram. Those two parameters that are, are not influencing the shape of the fundamental diagram are some parameters A and B, but those parameters absolutely do influence whether or not the vehicle is operating in a way that is string stable or not. Okay, so what we're trying to do here is basically understand the sensitivity of the uh, type of data that we can measure, assuming that we know everything else about the traffic dynamics. Let's suppose that we got a bunch of aggregate data. From the aggregate data, we can infer the parameters that are influenced by the fundamental diagram. And the only thing that we're left with is trying to determine whether these parameters A and B are, uh, what, what their values are. And A and B are important because if we know uh, uh, those values, then we can characterize whether or not the traffic is stable or string unstable. If it's string unstable, we're gonna have phantom traffic jams on the roadway. So basically, can we determine those parameters from the traffic conditions? I don't have the answer for you directly, but one way to start thinking about that is, do A and B influence the measurement data? Do A and B influence the count or average speed data that an inductive loop detector or radar unit could 
could measure. So here I'm showing simulations in which we fix the inflow, we fix the outflow, we produce some congestion. All of the parameters that determine the fundamental diagram are fixed at the same value. And all I'm checking is a set of three simulations with A and B fixed at 0.5 and 1.3 respectively. And down here, the A value has changed to 1.2, okay? And each of these simulations has a small amount of additive noise on the dynamic of each of the vehicles. And what you can see is optically, the type of traffic you see over time and space looks qualitatively similar under these parameters uh, in the top. And they look qualitatively similar, but distinct from the above images when the parameters have changed slightly. So across the rows here, the parameters are fixed. As you go up and down, the parameters are changing. The fact that changing A changes the picture here is hope that we might be able to identify A given uh, sort of the, the red boxed era areas here, which would be what I would see if I had a sensor installed at, for example, position 700 on the roadway. Okay, so what's next? Basically, we know that uh, A and B influence the stability, we know that the stability is manifesting in different time space dia uh, diagrams and it's gonna influence our sensor data. What I wanna know now is basically like how reliable uh, it, can I tell what these parameters are from, from sensor data. So here's, here's the basic setup. I'm basically gonna run a simulation with a fixed A and B, okay? I'm gonna fix A and B at 1.2 and 1.3. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run a, a bunch of simulations uh, using the exact same parameters A and B, right? I'm basically doing a bunch of Monte Carlo simulations and I'm comparing the sensor data I get from each of those uh, additional simulations with a sort of holdout sensor data, which I consider what I actually measured. And you can see there's variation uh, between each of the different recordings, right? So because of the stochasticity of the simulation, none of the measurements that I, I get exactly match uh, the sort of holdout measurement set. Uh, but, and there's some variation across it. And so what I can do is I can look at the expected loss or the, uh, between uh, the data from each simulation and my true measurement data and kind of see if the expected loss from simulations generated with the true parameters is higher or lower than the expected loss from, uh, from simulations that are generated with incorrect parameters. Okay, the correct pa parameters are all co colored here in orange the incorrect parameters are all shown here in blue. So what you can see is sort of the range of uh, the values of the loss function for each simulation, and the black bars here correspond with what the expected loss is. This is a good result. It basically says that if, you're, if you were you know, working in this glass house where the fundamental diagram has been fixed, and the only thing you had to distinguish was, uh, is, are these parameters over here in blue, uh, A equal to 0 0.5, and B equal to 1.3, are those my true parameters? Or how about these ones in, or in orange, A equal 1.2 and B equal 1.3? You'd run a bunch of Monte Carlo simulations, you compute the expected loss and you'd pick the one with the lowest expected loss and it turns out you'd be right. The orange simulations correspond with the, with the ones that were used to actually generate the true data. Okay, but it gets a little bit messier when you, know, you consider the, the opposite case. Here you've got two different distributions where the mean values are starting to overlap a little bit more. Well, what we've done instead is basically taken a grid search. We look at all the parameter values of A between 0.5 and 1.3, all the values of B in increments of 0.1 between 1 and 1.5. It gives us a collection of different parameters. We run Monte Carlo simulations given those parameters to account for the stochasticity of the simulation. And we look how many times an incorrect parameter pair gives an expected loss, which is lower than the true expected, uh, the expected loss from the true parameters given the same simulations. And here you see these things rank ordered. There are something like 44 or 45 parameter pairs that resulted in a lower expected loss in the RMSE sense than the true parameters did. This basically indicates that the loss functions uh, that we use are gonna have to be carefully curated. Just doing things like RMSE values in time sequences of sensor data is probably not going to lead to reliable ways to estimate the parameters. There's a lot back to, picked into this uh, slide, but basically I'm going to summarize it in saying that we tried a bunch of different loss functions and it doesn't really help. There aren't significant changes in the, in the performance of the, the loss functions. All have this type of issue that you can end up with parameter pairs that have lower expected loss than the true parameters do, indicating that even in this glass house setting, parameter identification from macroscopic data is going to be a hard problem. 
Yeah, and you've got about five minutes left. Yep. Thanks, Ravi. Um, let me just give a, a, a slight view of what we're thinking about doing once we start moving with not macroscopic data, not aggregate roadside data, but what happens when I can give you all of the traje trajectories that are coming from the cameras. Okay, so this is really microscopic model calibration with microscopic data. Here's a shot from one of our cameras on the test bed. Again, lead vehicle following our instrumented RAV4 that's logging data here. Uh, the setup is the same as we've seen before. We've got some dynamics for the car. We measure uh, from the following vehicle or this white ego vehicle, we measure the distance to the vehicle ahead. Uh, and we are given the initial condition, uh, how the cars are initially configured in terms of their space gap, as well as the initial speed of this following vehicle. So you're basically given everything. You get the measurement sequence, you get the, um, the initial condition, you get the input, the lead vehicle velocity profile at all times. And all I wanna know is what's the value of the parameters on which that following vehicle is driving. We'll take a small toy example to look at. It's the constant time headway relative velocity model. It basically has three parameters, K1, tau, and K2. It's basically trying to relax so that the uh, constant time gap is being maintained. The cars are trying to follow at a, at a tau second headway. And there's a second term here, which is trying to accelerate and decelerate so that your speed matches the car ahead. I run you two simulations, okay? The system one, these are the exact same ODEs. The only difference are the parameters. I've fixed K1 tau, the initial spacing and the initial speed to be the same in both simulations. The only thing I'm gonna change is the value of K1, this gain on this constant time headway term, okay? One of them, the gain is, is a value of one. The other it's, 0.001. And I want to know for this given vehicle, lead vehicle velocity profile, this is what the leader is doing. Are these things going to produce different spacings over time or the same? Obviously, you can tell by how specific the numbers are. This is kind of a leading question. Here's what the result looks like. The space gap that you measure from these systems running with everything the same except these pretty di distinct changes in the first parameter, K1, produce exactly the same space gap over time. So if you only measure the space gap, you have no way of uniquely identifying whether K1 should be 1.001, or in this case, I happen to know, any other possible value of K1. All values of K1 are equally good in terms of fitting this data. Okay, if you measure the, the velocities instead of the space gap, it doesn't help you. Uh, here's an example where, I, where we allow ourselves to also measure the velocity, not just the space gap, and the, st the story is exactly the same. So additional measurements aren't gonna help you here. So what's actually going on here? I give you the same dynamics, the same initial condition, some non-trivial input, and the models only differ by one parameter, but in a significant amount, it's not at equilibrium. I mean, it's like all the things that you would ask for in order to try to distinguish between these two models, and you can't uniquely identify that parameter K1. You're out of luck. Parameter K1 in this setting is just not identifiable. Okay, so here's the story played slightly differently. I actually changed the initial condition. Uh, I allow the initial velocity of the following vehicle to be different in the top and bottom simulation. Everything else is set as it was before. And now we can actually distinguish these profiles in the space gap. So, you know, all the information that you know here is going to be very important to characterize whether or not you can uniquely identify parameters. But we don't just want to do these sort of like guess and check settings. Uh, we want a way to actually directly test when we don't know uh, things, right? And so what we have done is set up a direct test for this. We measure the distance, take it as a norm between two pairs of parameters, and we look at how similar the outputs from systems under these different parameters are. So give me parameters which are as far apart as possible, such that the output of the systems are as close as possible, specified by this parameter epsilon. If epsilon is zero, the outputs need to be identical. And keep the parameters in some sensible domain. Just a remark that to tell the difference of the output of these things, what we really mean is solve this ODE system um, where the only thing that you're changing is what these values of the parameters are. Give me the parameters so that these uh, parameters are as far as apart as possible, but the outputs are as close as, as possible. And when we do this, we can basically control epsilon to basically say the outputs need to be the exact same, or if I increase epsilon, I allow some tolerance. It basically says, you know, you don't measure these things perfectly anyway. So if the, if the outputs are pretty close up to some noise threshold, um, you're still not going to be able to distinguish between these models under different parameter pairs. 
Okay, so we apply this direct test. That's actually how we found the example that I showed you earlier for the constant time headway relative velocity model. But we continue the game for yet another car following model, which is the, uh, the optimal velocity model with a uh, function given here with another set of complicated parameters. And this direct test, the punchline is basically that. It allows us to find parameters which are quite different, but that in terms of the output of the systems produce essentially the same space gap over time and the same velocity over time. So this is really getting to the point where what I'm, what I'm getting at is that we have a tool we can use. So if you give me a trajectory and you tell me that the, the model of the dynamic that you think that car is uh, following, I can tell you whether or not you can uniquely identify that parameter. We've been applying this, this type of idea to a variety of car following models uh, so that we can better characterize them. I won't spend much time here because I realize we're right out of time and basically tell you where we're going. So what I've done here so far is given you a lot of ideas for work in progress. Um, we're trying to build this test bed so that we can actually instrument the freeway at a level where we put you know, 100 automated vehicles on the roadway. We can understand what benefit we add, what benefit other drivers are doing, how cars are interacting with our control technologies and so on. Um, and then we're also thinking about like, how do we take the video data that's coming from these poles on this test bed, convert them into trajectories, and then how is that trajectory data going to help us understand the individual car following behavior of these vehicles? If we know we can't characterize specific parameters given the trajectories that we have, then what that allows us to do is design simulation environments where we test our controllers and make sure that our controllers are robust to the parameters that we can't uniquely identify. That will give us flexibility even if we can't completely characterize the behavior of vehicles on the roadway to design control laws that will account for that uh, lack of knowledge and still be able to do flow smoothing and simulation that will work on the railroad. So a lot of work still to come. Um, and you can, I think by now, see the complexity of what we're working on and why there's so many collaborators at so many universities that are helping in this cause. I do want to give a special acknowledgement to the students in my own group who have been instrumental in actually helping us in all aspects of this project. You can see it's not just a question of math, we need that. It's not just a question of engineering. We need a whole lot of that. But there's a whole lot of complexities just in coordinating uh, the various stakeholders that are involved to actually get us to that next frontier of really well instrumented open roadways that we can do cool stuff with to help unlock the next generation of connected and automated vehicle fleets. I'll leave it there. Thanks for your time.